Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this week for our live on disability in the arts. Um, I'm joined by Jack and Raina, who are two amazing campaigners and influencers in their own right. Um, just before I get them to introduce themselves, I just want to remind you that this week we relaunched our website, um, www.thedisabilityexpo.com, and you can sign up for our new newsletter um, and get regular updates on Disability Expo and what's happening next year on um, July 5th and 6th at the Excel Centre in London. Um, we'd love to have you a part of our event and come along and, for, and join in the activities and the showcase of all the amazing organisations that we're hoping to work with. So, um, and that's kind of why we've got Jack and Rainer here today, because both of them hopefully will be involved in some aspect of our event next year. So um, can I start with you, Rainer? Do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Rena and I'm a Hidden Disabilities and um, Neurodiversity Champion. I'm a Creativity Coach and a Fashion Textile Designer. I'm Jack. I'm Jack. I work in the fundraising and partnerships team for a charity called Pursuing Independent Paths, which supports adults with learning disabilities to access the arts, employment and other pathways. And as part of that, bringing my lived experience as someone who's autistic and has dyspraxia. Thank you. So what I'll do is I'll kind of go through four or five questions. Um, but if you feel like you want to contribute to what I've asked, just go for it. Um, we'll have a free flowing, free flowing conversation. Um, and if anyone that's watching wants to ask any questions, just pop them in the chat and I'll make sure to ask Jack and Raina them. Um, so the first question, Jack, can you share any um, personal anecdotes or experiences that highlight the challenges that disabled people, people face in pursuing and participating in the arts? I know just before we went live, you kind of spoke a little bit about what you what your organisation is trying to do. Yeah, so it, it's there's challenges across the front and it sounds... It's always a, a difficult topic to talk about because it's whether you're talking about participating in the context of being able to access them. For, for example, our students who are adults with complex learning disabilities, we venues can be inaccessible, support networks and carers often are geared around nine to five, nine to five versus evening and weekend events. And that says nothing of we're based in London, but lots of the tube can be inaccessible. So accessing different venues, etc., can be nigh impossible. But then as well, we find so many of our students who join us are looking for careers in the arts and in that context they have advanced needs and we have to provide support there but the arts is probably one of the most competitive industries possible and so to start with a step kind of a, a step back to have the opposite of a head start that some of our students do automatically hinders them because it's an industry where whether through connections, whether through it's having the wealth to be able to support yourself in an industry that's not famed for paying well, um, not having those alongside the challenges our students face from, obviously, it can be difficulties in processing speed or how they are mobile, through to, of course, the public stigmas that come from being disabled. Um, there are a litany of challenges that can come forward. But I think one of the greatest ones that, we struggle against is um the arts and this, the arts and individuals with disability can too often be seen as the nice to haves and when you have two nice to haves stacked upon each other then you get really into the territory where people get left behind mm -hmm. and i think that's something which whether it's accessing whether it's participating whether it's finding careers in the arts it's something that fundamentally can be left behind and that makes sense in a cost of living crisis and at times when people are queuing to access food banks but fundamentally it is a problem and a significant one and one that's only getting exacerbated um Raina, turning to you i know we've spoken about in the past about expression and about how art is your your release for you with your neurodiversity and the work that you do so can you talk a little bit about what expression and art means to you and how do you use design to embrace your neurodiversity Okay, I'm going to try and make this a quick, <laughs> quick one. Um, I'll talk from experience as a child um, because of my hard of hearing, um, dyslexia, which wasn't diagnosed so much later on at university. I felt like I delved into art kind of more on my own through through primary school and through secondary school. And it was my way of um, kind of expressing myself and kind of a bit of um, my outlet, a bit of running away really. Uh, um, someone who I felt like um, I wasn't understood as a child. So I didn't feel like it was 
kind of something that was accessible to me is in here use that instead but i done it myself like it, it was just a way of me to to get by i felt like art and expressing myself through dance and music um just doodling um and painting was just my way of it basically saved me so and that's how i feel with it um so in in that respect i've kind of delved into it bit by bit throughout my life and it's also why i'm really heavily passionate about being able to express yourself fully no matter what that is whether it's through voice or whether it's through movement or whether it's through painting um just anything the way you walk where you talk you know all that is kind of really should be something that we're able to tap into quite easily but growing up as well you know from a child into an adult we kind of grow out of that more and more and kind of more in our heads and less in our bodies i hope to answer the question it's kind of it's such a big topic definitely it. Um, and you both oh sorry carry on sorry go ahead no what were you gonna say and no, I, I lost the telephone go oh, and go sorry. No, it's all right because you asked um how do i embrace it yeah or, like um well, as, as a creativity coach, I, I come offering that to other, uh, currently at the moment, women in general who are neurodiverse and particularly who are dyslexic um, or who have ADHD or are hard of hearing um, because there's a way of kind of tapping into a different kind of world there. And it's just um, a way of um, really getting to know how to navigate your way in the world you know, especially in fully embracing and celebrating who you are. So that's a really important message that I'm trying to get across, really. And do you both, both to both of you, do you think that art helps us not only to express ourselves, but kind of come to terms with what we might be going through? I know we've both spoken in the past with both to both of you about um, the role of communication and, and art and stuff via email when we've been talking about the the structure of today's conversation. I don't know who wants to come in first on that one. Go first. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it, it's a fascinating one, this one, because like through my own prism, I was someone who was non-verbal for a long period and then express myself through art was something I benefited enormously. But I was a young child. And I think in the context of PIP and my organization, we find that for so many of our students, the ability to not only be able to express themselves in what I'll call non-typical ways through their art, not relying on language or kind of understanding that primary mechanism of communication. But I think it's also a way of, and from, and this is in the context of kind of for so many people, they are underestimated. The art that any individual can turn out, whether it's an art, we have graphic design sessions, we have community, like, mixed material sessions and we have two students who've made films that are being part, submitted to kind of a f the festival before the BAFTAs and they have a decent chance of securing awards and that is because that is a medium they feel comfortable with and they are able to not only be able to be creative but they are able to showcase all of their strengths in that medium and it works absolutely fantastically. And I think that's one of the things that is so challenging in a context where increasingly the art schemes are being pared back or shut down because it's becoming more and more limited who can access those. Can and what do you think, Reina? Can you repeat the question for me? Sorry. Um, yeah, so obviously with um, art, it's, it's, it uses a tool, tool to communicate as well as express yourself. Um, and so it was really about what what role do you think that art has in that in allowing people to come to terms with their their diagnosis or their disability and living well with it well um talking from the kind of fashion and textile side of it I, i'm making you know living out of being expressive and doing my art so this is one of my my scars and that's, that's all hand painted and so for me i i express it through my sort of painting and i do bespoke work from that so in that respect it's important that if you do have something that's really important to you in the arts or in the creative world that I know it's really limited and I know in the kind of old kind of sense way we're told you know you can't make a living 
<laughs> in, cre in the creative world but i do feel like it is changing actually quite mm. quite a bit especially for smaller um, businesses and small owners um which is actually quite nice to see so um you know i, I create pieces bespoke to the customer let, let's just say and they come with me with a vision and we co-create something together like i like these colors and i or someone came up to me and said, you know, I had a dream last night and it was a snake and it was turned into, it was this colour and it was that colour. And, you know, I'd ask them, like, what's, what's the word that's come up for you? And it's a transformation. So, you know, kind of co-creation mm. in the kind of creativity world is, I think it's, 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 it's really important because it unites people. It's not just that one singular person. And it's, um, it's, a, it's, a form, it's a form of love, passion that can really just gather people together. And that's something I feel is really important that we don't lose in our lives as growing up. You know, you get you get you get the you get the thing. Well, I'm not an artist. I'm not a creative. And I feel like every, well, every person is creative. You know, is born an artist. It's just we are born out of it, out of creativity, out of the arts, because we're all like math, science, English. And as a primary former primary school teacher, I could really see that from working from nursery all the way up until you know year three i mean even year one was like already sitting at the table and getting all serious math science english you know and it's it's quite sad to see that and how do we in my head how do we kind of extend that and keep that going all the way through I've I've had think some... oh sorry oh. Carry on, Jack. I, and i was gonna say that's what i think what's interesting there is kind of in the context of um we are a non-traditional educational thing. So we don't work towards qualifications is what I mean by that. I think that's what's interesting in the context of arts and creativity. In a school, you are increasingly, it works towards a defined outcome. I always find it difficult that and when you're up on art GCSE, you can be objectively good or bad and someone can grade something and then you grade techniques as part of it. But I think this is what's fascinating for us. And it's one of the questions in the chat about what can you learn that's unexpected? I think it's that context of individuals that creativity can be defined as different things and i think particularly in a world where you consider neurodiversity we value van gogh and his creativity and the way he used colors and his techniques through the prism of his struggles and how he fought differently mm -hmm. and i think it's one of the difficulties we face is the arts as people access them can too often be defined in a neurotypical fashion and that's what's so fascinating about this panel because there's someone who is neurodiverse who runs creativity sessions and i think also as well people in the talk who are talking about there's kind of community artists that are dedicated to running inclusive events that can work so well because it's i always say often neurodiversity is like looking through a stained glass window if you're trying to see the same thing as someone else you're going to have a distorted image and if you try and make that conform obviously you have a lesser image but if you try and allow the creativity to come out there then in that context you'll have something pretty special oh can't hear you that's a bit awkward um I'll, I'll repeat myself um so to both of you what role do you think that um art plays in advocacy work i know that from your perspective jack you're working with people who are disabled to empower them and to give them a voice um, and Raina you're working with individuals to kind of help them express themselves and come embrace that that creative side of things so you've got two different perspectives there what 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 role do you think art and that has in, in advocacy and in helping make art more accessible to other people <sighs> so at the moment for me I've I'm creating my next event um, called the Neuro Mummers Collective, which is bringing uh, mums in particular to have more accessibility to that. And it's uh, it's a free event. And so I'm just ignoring, you know, and inviting them to, to this event where they can we roll out the mats and um, get out our different mediums and, and really just allow ourselves to let go and actually discuss openly about what is it that then um, that's kind of what's the resistance they're having in their daily life. Um, and actually discussing as a collective, you know, what what's their takeaway, what's your takeaway, and what helps you, like really um, sharing the tools and resources amongst each other, and really making it quite a nice, open, safe space. Um, 
as as Jack was saying before, like you know the creativity thing, and like someone the way someone looks at someone else's work is so different to you know how can you that whole grading system needs to kind of be put, shoved out because it's just you just can't grade someone's artistry or creativity. So it's it's about providing a space really where it's safe to that person that they can express themselves fully, whether it be you know drawing, writing or voice work or drumming that they're not you know it's non-judgmental environment it's about creating a non-judgmental environment and really fully engaging and embracing um getting to embrace you know who who they are that's my thought on that yeah i think adding to that the arts and whether we i think to kind of reduce them to that ability to be creative and to have autonomy and to be able to express yourself from our context we see too often sadly top-down led campaigns where people are saying this is what people with disabilities need and i've experienced that too often when people are saying this is what it's like to be autistic this is and it's kind of it's a reductionist is a really harsh word but it is and it's kind of we part of why the arts are so important for anyone let alone people who are who face more difficulties than others. It's that ability to find your voice in the way you want to. We we have a project called Gig Buddies, which is focused on pairing adults with disabilities with volunteers to access the arts. And we have committed to that the logo, the branding, the marketing materials are all originating from the students. When we work with designers and we kind of get them into the various vectors and all those formats we need it in, but it comes from the students because fundamentally we find it pointless and which is a strong word but what is the point of us working on a project that is meant to support adults with disabilities to access the arts if we don't work with them at the inf at the first stages for them to be able to express why it's important and from that context we are six months into that project we've had a launch event at the royal abbott hall but more importantly we've had articles in time out and other publications about this issue and that has come because it's not me writing a press release, it's because it's the beneficiaries. And one of our students has wrote the piece in Time Out. It's frustrating, it's the best thing I've ever read and I haven't done it. Um, but fundamentally, if anyone's gonna be able to advocate, and be creative and to express why something's important, it's the person whom it's important to. I know you've both spoken heavily about co-creation um, and we've had some amazing comments in the in the chat about the, the the resources that are available in certain areas and how limited it is to access those those resources. What do you think are some of the the key barriers and misconceptions within within art and within accessing art that prevent disabled people from getting involved? Jack, do you want to take that first? Oh, more than happy to. Uh, I was jumping at the bit anyway. Um, <laughs> so I think in that context, um, we have to look fundamentally at the the arts are suffering from a funding crisis and that is coming at the cost of schemes which are designed to prevent uh, to promote accessibility that comes in the context where we are based in Kensington and Chelsea London so central London on our doorstep you have the legacy infrastructure assets which were not designed with accessibility in mind up until two years ago we were in a building with more stairs than any individual can count and it took us an absolute half a decade to find an actually accessible building we were comfortable with that had room for the arts. But I think also as well in that context, it is the recognition within the industry and by individuals who work in it on what the process must look like to become accessible. In this context, too often we see organizations who are good at either doing the proactive work or doing the reactive work. And we, we had a brilliant time working with a local theatre to enable a panto trip where we did all the paperwork correctly and everything was great and we felt really confident attending when on the day itself all it took was one poorly trained person to suddenly have someone unable to access the venue and stuck outside in the rain and you need to have kind of that work in the run-up and on the day and i think it is a mindset and one that is slowly coming forward and one that comes from if you are 
older, your experience of autism may be the rain man. That might be what you were conditioned on, not me sat in your audience wearing earplugs and you're wondering if I'm wearing headphones. Um, and so, yeah, I think it is a thing of fundamentally, you can have the legacy challenges, which are, of course, always going to be difficult. You can have the current challenges regarding funding and everything else to do with that. But I think also as well, it does come from the point of view of individuals being being not only proactive, but being comfortable stating what they do wrong. And we're part of that. We need to have automatic door openers in our building. There is more everyone can be doing in that context. But for some reason, people can be scared to admit when they do it wrong. And from that, you can never take learnings. And what about you, Reina? You would have to repeat the question now. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so what do, you think you. Some, what do you think are some of the common barriers and misconceptions around the arts and accessing it for disabled people? I know you touched upon earlier that in school and the work you were doing with young people compared to what you do now, I don't know if you've seen a change from when you were at the school to where you are now in, in terms of your work and the barriers that are faced. <laughs> It's a really tricky one for me to comment on this because um, I don't haven't necessarily um, come across barriers in access to art because I feel like art is kind of is kind of everywhere. I mean, it's different to what Jack's talking about. For me, like you can create it in front of you, like it's mm -hmm. you know it, it, it's available, in, in, you know, straight in front of you. You can create anything. Um, and it's it's this it's this notion that we need specific something to be in that room or to be in that studio to create that. And, and actually, you've got it all within you. You are your own resource. That's what I believe. And obviously, to a certain degree, um, you know. Um, but if I talk back as a, as a primary school teacher and, and to now, I do feel like we have more of a creative curriculum, but we still got a long way to go. Um, with the hierarchy of, of subjects and things like that um, and, and, and where we see like drama and music and, and the arts um, and depend, you know compared to the what we call the more academic topics so um, you know science and the maths and the English um, but for me it's it's um, you know how I think Jackson mentioned something like it starts from the student for me it starts from like babies you know all the way from babies and it's like how we bring up our children, you know, from birth, to, you know, to the toddlers, to the teenage, you know, to adulthood, and 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 this whole thing that this condition that we have of what's important in the world, and you know, you know, being a lawyer, being you know, all, all these like hard and fast kind of like rules, as opposed to yeah, it's fine for you to just to spend your time just drawing on that picture. It's fine for you to just spend time doodling or just going outside to play and creating something with leaves in the woods. Something so simple as this. Um, but something came into my head and I'm just, I hope it's just in the pocket, hold on. Um, there's something that I say to my children because I'm really intent on this one. Before I drop them off to school, I say to them, be the best you can be and that's good enough for, and they say me because what I don't want them having is this constant external validation that they need to feel good about themselves, yeah. feel good about the work they create, you know, in any topic that they do. So I don't care about certificates. I don't care about stickers. None of that. None of that doesn't mean anything to me. And, you know, I'm just happy if they, if they can access and navigate this world in their own creative minds, um, feeling like they they are able and free to, for, to do this without judgment. Um, yeah, and it's kind of keep, keep, keeping that creative mind alive mm. going through. But that does come from, obviously, the adult as well who's bringing up that child. So it's just that it's just the undoing and the unconditioning of society, really, and how we've been drilled into believing that creativity is not part of us. Like, we're not our own resource, but we are. You have your voice. And it's just, yeah. We've had a love that in capitals from Alan. Um, so I think that resonates with a lot of people. Um, there's also a comment from Lorraine that says that it's worth taking a look at um, the outside in organization. And there's, she's put a quote saying, um, since 2006, outside in have provided a platform for artists 
who see themselves as facing barriers to the arts due to health, disability, social circumstance or isolation. The goal is to create a fairer art world which rejects traditional values and institutional judgments about the work they can and should be displayed. So like going back to what you were saying about it doesn't matter what other people think about the art that someone's creating or how they're embracing that traditional focus of what is what I guess what's what's beautiful and what's not when you create art because I guess art is really subjective um and it should be because it's about the individual who's created it um in terms of building on the advocacy works that we've kind of talked about and how do we champion art for disabled people and access to it what strategies and initiatives do you think that companies can do to really embrace that and help their staff who might have a disability or might be disabled to embrace kind of being creative in the work they do because i know that we live in quite a technical age where it's limited in how we can express ourselves through art and stuff so i don't know what you guys think on that i'll give you a moment to ha have a think because i think that's quite I'm, a... I'm happy to jump in here <laughs> we'll do short straw there um i think fundamentally it there's a, there's a general question of what kind of organizations and particularly like kind of employers and stuff can do just to support people with disabilities and then there's the creativity part as point part of that and i think too often organizations are prescriptive in their approach to people with disabilities i've had to join more compulsory trainings at prior jobs than i'd like to admit um which is just an ironic form of disability discrimination i had the same amount of work and there's less time to do it but in the context here i think many organizations and i think this is something which is one of the few positives being post covid 19 are were focused on presenteeism which can be difficult for people with disabilities but also as well were very uh, prescriptive in methods of working which is just never which is always something which will always stifle those with neurodiversity because we can think of different methods um but i think in the context of the arts i think it's one of the things that we have found works so well is showcasing the best. And for example, we have many of our students, I have been really fortunate to get roles in creative industries. Now that can be things working in the theatres and the operational sides of stewards or the ticket office through to we got one student and experience in the internal comms team at Universal Music Group. Um, and fundamentally, the biggest challenge we had going in is the stigma and the biggest challenge we had going out was too many advocates saying they were amazing everything we thought they could do that and more and i think one of the ways to address the, the baggage and perceptions that people have about people with disabilities of all forms is simply to showcase that often they come from a place of ignorance and fundamentally often that is as happens with outside in organization as through Rainer's work it is an ability it is making sure that people have a platform because after that you have this positive spiral where people can are able to express themselves and from that comes more opportunities we hope um obviously there's there's times when that spiral can be broken it can be someone leaving the role particularly advocate or times of funding crises or pandemics or whatever else sadly there aren't there are many reasons why stuff can be stifled but um, I think it is a thing of kind of exposure is the fantastic, the, the greatest asset. There. Um, and I think part of that is often being willing to put your hand up and say, I don't know what's next, but I'm willing to try. What do you think, Raina? What can organizations do to kind of champion change and help employees and their community to embrace art when it comes to not just being disabled, but also things like mental health and expression. Oh, wow, it's a huge one. <laughs> I think it's worth noting because I, I, I'm on the kind of hidden disabilities side of things. And it's because, you know, as Jack said, it's not so obvious, you know, why are you wearing those headphones in and, you know, mm. you know is it headphones? Is it like, you know, because I, I do that as well. I, I get sensory overload and it, and it can cause nausea and and dizziness and just throw me off for for weeks even um so it's it's um we have very two different areas don't we in terms of society right it's like the neurotypical and the you know non-disabled and then you've got that you know the other side right and it's about it's about uniting these two and so that there is a kind of 
interlinking this language of communication how how do we do that and it's by you know seeing the seeing the the strength in someone who's who is neurodiverse let's just say for example and what that what they can bring to a company which we've we've i've, I've seen on, on quite a few platforms at the moment and uh people like richard branson who comes on and talks about you know what you know what that's done for him and you know getting like other people who are already kind of there in the world who have experienced it talk about it more um to normalize this because this is normal for our for, for people like us for someone who's either physically or hidden disability say you know disabled you know it's it's normal um and i suppose i suppose for me uh I can only speak from my experience and my stories as someone who has grown up with that um, kind of almost trauma as well of not being understood, actually being completely misunderstood as a child um, and being bullied and, uh, you know, um, being made fun of for wearing a hearing aid um, and wearing glasses and, you know, all the way down my, you know, the road. And when I look back and I think, there must be other people in, in this world who, who've experienced mm. that. But the difference is for me, because I had the arts as my way of expression, as my outlet, as what saved me, I'm okay. So if I could share my story, let's say, and other people who have these stories out there to talk about, you know, where where they've come from in their life and how this has helped them, because I feel like for, you know, linking this to mental health, I mean, it's just at the utmost for me, it's like up there. There's nothing in life more important than than your mental health and your well-being, and making creativity and the arts more accessible to people in like in, in their jobs, even to be able to express themselves fully, is is so important. I know there's some companies that are now increasingly including well-being in their practice. So they have like a, like a six session to talk to like maybe a therapist or something, you know. But what I would love to see is like, for instance, is someone bringing in someone like me into the inset day in, in you know, in the in the school, let's say, in a primary school for the teachers, because I know that, that world and that life and how hard it is and bringing like creativity and self-expression into their world so they can then pass it on and like weave it in into the children and, and for themselves. So I mean, that, that question is like a big, big fight, you know, <laughs> kind of worms here, but you know, like it's a, it's a, it's a non-starter topic there. Um, it's just keep banging on that drum until mm. you get heard is, is my thing. Um, yeah. We've spoken a lot about the challenges and kind of how we get more people involved. And I don't know if, you guys have got any examples of times when you've used your own creativeness or you've helped someone else to embrace their creative like the creativeness within them um that you want to share because i think it's really important when we talk about these things to bring a bit of hope um to to the conversation so i don't know who wants to come in first on that one yeah i forget the question i've got to answer it <laughs> no worries so um i have a really um special friend of mine who has a really rare condition called nut, nutcracker syndrome, which I never heard of until she told me. And without getting too much into about it, because it's actually a really complex condition, but it's all about, you know, compressing the veins and the arteries to the point where she feels like she's constantly nauseous, she can't really breathe properly, but she uses her voice as self-expression. Um, I, um, during my kind of coaching, I said, do you mind if we, we, I kind of help you with this and so I just through encouragement really um by hearing her sing and going wow I mean honestly you wouldn't think that this comes from her because it's just it's just absolutely incredible and I I I literally get goosebumps every time I hear her sing and um I've just been kind of almost like drip feeding using more of a holistic kind of framework um something that you can action basically to make a difference and slowly slowly she's been increasingly singing at weddings doing gigs and and also um, recording you know songs and it that all that took was a bit of encouragement and a bit of um mm. listening active listening and 
but also connecting the mind and body, which is something that I've spoken about before. So those tools, like somatic um, tools, are really, I find, important, realigning um, ourselves again. And I've already forgotten the question. <laughs> I guess I get, I get so, <laughs> so many, like, avenues. Um, I hope that's not No, I think, you've, I think you've perfectly, I think that's a really good example. I think it highlights how we can empower people to 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 be creative and to embrace what their strengths are because i think her voice seems like a really good strength that it's right that we empower someone like that to to use that and to to be creative and embrace who they are jack do you have any examples um uh, i'll give two which is me being a bit selfish and guys i can't pick between them um <laughs> But they are thematically different. One's about careers and one's about accessing the art. So on the careers side, I think uh, there's an absolutely incredible scheme run by the John Lyons charity. We work with arts charities in nine boroughs of London. And John Lyons charity funds apprenticeships for young people who have SEND to access careers. And it's kind of designed to be one to two year roles, uh, very much focused on ensuring, firstly, that the role isn't token. But more importantly, that it is a development role so these young people can gain experience and progress onto careers. And it's a brilliant example of what I was talking about earlier, where sometimes the best way to achieve change is to showcase what's possible. And they use this funding to showcase what adults of SEND can do and try and do so not only in larger organisations, but in smaller community arts organisations as well. And it works absolutely incredibly. Um, and it's testament to their kind of leading the way on that. And the other one, which is tooting our own horn. Um, so there's an incredible worldwide project called Gig Buddies as part of the Stay Up Late campaign, often for adults with complex learning disabilities, care networks, families, et cetera, can be an impediment to going out in the evenings or weekends. So it's a scheme which pairs adults with volunteers um, to be able to access their interests. Now, often that is the arts, but it can be sports, it can be anything like that. And there are dozens of chapters in Australia, England, Wales, Scotland, and abroad. And um, what works so brilliantly about it is, as I said earlier, it's often led by the adults with learning abilities. They work on the marketing, the comms, the messaging. They work on the training documents. But also as well, what is wonderful about it is it is giving exactly what is often needed, which is the friendships that are formed from the project between the volunteers and the adults with learning abilities are absolutely genuine and long lasting. It's just that bit of help to get that over the small bumps that often exist to enable people to unlock their passions, to, to access new hobbies and to be able to ensure that they can enjoy everything of life and often the best bits of life are those which are creative and it's something which is going to be, no doubt achieve worldwide domination but we are covering central london um gigbodycentral.org.uk and um if anyone would like to volunteer or join as a, a gig goer but they're two great schemes for the careers and for accessing the arts i feel thank you both i think that's a really powerful way to to draw this to a close um we've had some really good questions from everyone in the audience that's watching and comments so thank you for participating online um just to remind you that our website relaunched this week and that's www.thedisabilityexpo.com and you can sign up to our newsletter there and get regular updates about disability expo and what's happening at next year's event at london excel on the 5th and 6th of july Thank you to Jack and Raina for joining me today. It's been really powerful having you speak. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. And we'll be back on the 4th of December for a live on digital accessibility. Um, but you can follow our social media for regular updates on that and what's happening. So thank you all.